everybody. I'm Storm Mushry, Conservation Education Manager with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And today we're very fortunate. We have Dr. Jenny Seamster. Uh, she's in charge of our Bison M program and also the Share with Wildlife program. But she's going to be giving us a very interesting presentation today dealing with, uh, I believe it's going to be some of our non-game stuff and species of greatest conservation need. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Seamster. Great. Thank you so much, Storm. I'm really happy to be here and able to talk to you about the Share with Wildlife program. Um, as you mentioned, it the Share with Wildlife program does focus on species that are not hunted and not fished. Um, and in particular, it focuses on species of greatest conservation need. And I'll talk about that a little bit more during the presentation. Um, I do coordinate uh, both Share with Wildlife and the Biota Information System of New Mexico. And so I will talk a little bit about um, that system, which its abbreviation is Bison M. Um, and I'll talk about that at the very end of the presentation. Just for a little bit of background on myself and how I got interested in wildlife and came to work for New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Um, I first got excited about wildlife back when I was in fifth grade. I went up to Denver to visit the Denver Zoo with my family and saw a snow leopard there and I just I fell in love with big cats. And so really ever since then I've been interested in wildlife and have known that I wanted to do something to help and, and work with wildlife. Um, I got both a both of my degrees um, from the University of Virginia. I have a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a PhD in Environmental Sciences. Uh, the first job that I got after grad school was working with uh, spatial data with the Trust for Public Land. Uh, the Trust for Public Land is a nationwide organization, um, but it is the office that I was in was in Santa Fe, which is where I grew up. Um, and I was working with them, making a lot of maps, helping with data collection, data analysis, and quality control efforts. Um, after that, I worked uh, for three years as a postdoctoral research scientist at New Mexico State University. Um, half of that time, I was actually based within New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. I was doing some contract work for them. Um, and that was a great opportunity to get to meet people in the department and learn about what the department does. Uh, for part of the time as a research scientist at New Mexico State, I was uh, modeling climate change effects and looking at impacts of climate change on a number of different species found in New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. Um, after finishing up some of that work, uh, this position that I'm currently in the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish opened up, and I was very happy to join the department as the Bison M Share with Wildlife Coordinator in 2015. So, um, as you can tell from the title for my position, it's a split position. Basically, half of my time is supposed to be spent with Share with Wildlife, and half is supposed to be spent with Bison M. Um, I'm going to emphasize Share with Wildlife in this talk. Uh, Share with Wildlife is a grant program and it funds wildlife projects all around New Mexico. Um, Bison M is basically just a huge database. And like I said before, I'll talk about it very briefly at the end. So a little bit more about Share with Wildlife. Um, this program has been around since the early 1980s. Um, and as I mentioned, I've only been involved with it since 2015. Uh, Share with Wildlife funds four different type of wildlife focused projects, uh, habitat enhancement, research, education, and rehabilitation. The emphasis is on species that don't receive a lot of support from other funding sources. And that is why a lot of the projects deal with those non-game species and in particular species of greatest conservation need. Uh, Share with Wildlife is a donation based program uh, one of the biggest sources of income that we currently have is the sale of the four license plates that you can see at the bottom of the slide. And we have been releasing new plates every couple years uh, since I joined the program. And uh, the one on the lower right hand corner, the Roadrunner, um, is the latest one. And of course, it shows our state bird, the, the Greater Roadrunner. 
Um, we do match the money that we receive uh, from donations against federal money, specifically state wildlife grant money from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that really helps us maximize the amount of work that we can do for New Mexico's wildlife. Uh, the budget that I work with is 200000 a year. Um, and I do cap the per project dollar amount at 50000 um, And the goal with that is really to try to be able to fund as many projects benefiting as many species as we can. Over the past 10 years, just to give you a sense of what the program's been up to, uh, we funded just under 100 projects, uh, averaging about 15 projects a year, some years with more, some years with less. Uh, we've spent just under $2 million, um, and that's been given out to 55 different contractors. Uh, those contractors are individuals that work with universities. They may be researchers or professors at universities. Uh, we work with nonprofits. We work with for-profit for consulting firms um, and individual consultants. Uh, we work with federal agencies. We work with all different kinds of people. And that is part of what I love about what I do is the fact that I get to work with so many different people, not only in New Mexico, but who come into state from other states. Uh, the graph just shows the breakout in funding over the past 10 years among those four different categories that I mentioned. Uh, we do fund a lot of research projects, and so I'm going to emphasize research projects uh, during the rest of my presentation. Uh, but I will also mention a few of the rehabilitation and education projects that we've supported in the past few years. Now, Share With Wildlife does have a lot of different objectives, but one of the overarching objectives that it has is to help the 235 species that New Mexico Department of Game and Fish has identified as species of greatest conservation need. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that species may be on this list. Um, it may be that we simply don't know very much about them and we need to learn more. Um, for some species, we do know a lot and what we know is concerning. We're worried that the species is um, declining in numbers. Uh, maybe it's only found in a very small part of the state. And if something happened to that area, it could be very uh, impactful in a negative way for the species. Um, there's all different kinds of reasons that a species is, is on this list of 235. Um, and what I see sure with wildlife's role in all of this is to help species progress along the spectrum that's shown at the bottom of the slide with the, with the arrow. And the goal is to get species to go from being species that maybe we don't know much about them um, Share with Wildlife can help fund research projects that fill in the information gaps, get us the information that we need about those species. We can move them along to being species that we actually know enough about them, that they're top priorities for doing on the ground work. Um, that work might be habitat restoration. Um, it might be ensuring that there's enough food or other resources on the ground for that species. And ultimately the goal should really be that we know enough and we've done enough for the species that they are no longer on that list of species of greatest conservation need. Now these are pictures of just a small subsample of some of the species that we funded projects for through Share With Wildlife in the past few years. Um, the main point of this slide is just to say we work with a lot of different types of species all over New Mexico. And I am gonna be talking about several of the species shown on this slide. Um, looking at the top, I'm gonna to look at terrestrial snails, um, the three fish species, the Rio Grande sucker, Rio Grande chub, and the Chihuahua chub. Um, I'm gonna talk more about the Western River cooter, which is a turtle species. And then um, I'm gonna be talking about the Penascalese chipmunk. And there's a couple bird species I'm gonna talk about that are not shown on this slide. Uh, this is a map that shows the distribution of areas where projects were done. Um, that, and these are specifically projects that I'm going to be talking about um, in the next several, next several slides. And the goal of this map is just to say that work has been done all over the state, supported through Share With Wildlife. 
the projects that I picked are ones that uh, have to do with the diversity of different species that are found in a lot of different parts of New Mexico and um, for which the researchers that are working with these species use a lot of different and interesting techniques to study them. Um, I really want to paint a picture of the, the breadth of the work that's done through Share With Wildlife. So the next several slides, I'm just going to walk through different projects that Share With Wildlife has funded since I've been in charge of the program. So the first project I want to talk about deals with the Penasco least chipmunk, and you can see two pictures of that species in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. Um, if you look really hard at the bottom picture, you can see that that chipmunk actually has a blue um, tag in its ear. And that means that that chipmunk had been captured and that tag put on um, so that if, that if the researchers see that animal again, they'll know that it was caught before and they'll know that specific, that specific individual and they can kind of track that animal over time. Um, this project is being done by researchers at New Mexico State University. Um, there's a professor at New Mexico State and her lab group. Um, and for four years, we supported uh, a variety of different types of work that they were doing with the Penasco least chipmunk. Uh, the map shows the areas where this work was done. It's all in uh, southeastern New Mexico. And um, if you're familiar with that part of the state, it was more specifically in the Sacramento mountain range and in the, the northern part of the Sacramento mountains. So um, the pictures on this slide, if you look at the top picture, shows an example of the sorts of habitat that you might find Penasco these chipmunks. Um, these chipmunks are found in high elevation areas, not quite above tree line. They, they do seem to like areas that have a few trees, uh, but you're not gonna find them in dense forests. So we're talking about high altitude and frankly, pretty challenging places to do work, um, especially when there's storms that come in during the summer and, and so on. Um, there's several different techniques that the researchers have been using to study the Penasco least chipmunk. Uh, they have used live traps and that's shown in the um, first photo in that second row of photos. Um, but live trapping in this high elevation, often cold environment uh, can be very challenging and you definitely don't want to leave animals out uh, during a storm, for example. You don't want them to be in a trap during a storm. So to address some of those challenges, uh, the researchers started investigating the use of camera traps and that's shown in this second photo here. Um, basically, you set up a, a camera that's triggered by movements of an animal that comes in front of the camera. Um, at the bottom, you can see a picture of a chipmunk that's checking out a bait tube uh, that was set out in front of one of those cameras. And by using these camera traps, uh, the researchers have actually been able to get a lot of data on a lot of different chipmunks without ever putting hands on them. They've had to go through thousands and thousands of photos to do it, but at the end, they have a really great data set um, about where the species is found um, and what kinds of environments it's using. Uh, for the few chipmunks that they did end up capturing using live trapping techniques, they put um, tracking devices on those animals. And the, the last picture over here is of a student helping to track where a chipmunk is in this meadow um, environment up in the northern part of the Sacramento Mountains. And by tracking individual chipmunks, they were able to get much more detailed information on the areas that the chipmunks are using throughout the course of of several months during the summer. Um, these surveys are really important because this species hadn't been detected in New Mexico since 2000. So it was high time that it be re-looked at and that we learned more about where it's currently found. Um, it was very exciting that they could use those camera traps and that they could differentiate the Penasco least chipmunk from another species that's found um, in the mountains where the Penasco least chipmunk lives and they can differentiate photographs of those two species. 
Um, they were able to get really good home range information on chipmunk movements for 15 different individuals. Um, and using the photographs from the camera traps, they're able to look at when chipmunks are active, not only during the year, but even during the course of a single day. Uh, the second research projects I wanna talk about is also in Southeastern New Mexico. Um, this deals with the Western River Cooter, which is a species of turtle. Um, the photographs show an adult turtle and then a uh, baby or a hatchling turtle. And the surveys for this project were done along the uh, Pecos River and especially along a tributary to the Pecos, the, the Black River. Um, and then some of the work was done in Chavez County um, at Bitter Lake National Wildlife Refuge and a stream that flows into the, to the refuge. And this work was supported for three years and uh, we were working with researchers at Eastern New Mexico University for this project. Uh, so the, the photo at the top is a picture of the Black River. Um, the photo uh, here of this hoop net trap, um, these are traps that were used by the researchers to capture uh, Western River cooters in the Black River and other places. Uh, to check the traps when there's enough water in the river, uh, they would use a canoe. Um, and once they had captured turtles, what they were doing, they were measuring them. Um, they were pit tagging them, which means they were putting a, um, a tag with a unique identifier on it into the, the body of the turtle. Um, and once you scan that turtle, if you catch it again, you'll know the specific um, individual and you'll know the history of where that animal had been seen before and captured before. Um, and the last thing that they were doing was x-raying the turtles. Um, you can get a lot of really good information from those x-rays. Uh, this particular project, they did capture several hundred, several hundred turtles. Um, they did find this species in a new county where it hadn't previously been documented um, as being alive. Um, they figured out that they could identify individual um, young turtles just by taking photographs of the underside of their shells. Um, and that was important because juvenile turtles are too small to insert a pit tag. And so if you wanna know if you've caught that animal again, um, they needed a, a different way of doing that for the, for the juvenile turtles. And this was a really nice non-invasive approach to doing that. Um, from, from the x-rays, uh, they were looking at a number of things. One of them was whether turtles had ingested fish hooks or had been shot. Um, there were six turtles that they found um, that had either ingested a fish hook or had been shot at. Um, they were able to look at the number of eggs and the size of eggs um, that uh, females had. Um, they could figure out based on when the females had uh, shelled eggs in their bodies, uh, when those females were most likely to be leaving the river and going and finding a nesting spot. Um, and they could confirm that the turtles um, were able to nest at least twice during a single season. Um, the next project I want to talk about deals with three different species of fish, uh, the Rio Grande chub, the Chihuahua chub, and the Rio Grande sucker. Um, this work we, we've been supporting for three years. Um, the last year is actually going to be uh, this year. Um, so the, the work is not done yet, but um, the goal of this particular project is to learn more about the distribution of these three species. Um, the Chihuahua chub is only found in southwestern New Mexico along the Membrish River, but um, the Rio Grande chub and the Rio Grande sucker are found in a lot of different streams, many of them in northern New Mexico, but they're also found in some streams in southern New Mexico. And uh, 
for these three species, what the uh, researchers with U.S. Forest Service and individuals associated with Turner Ranch properties, um, what they're doing is they're using environmental DNA survey techniques. And this is a really cool approach to learning about species. Um, basically, as, a, as an animal, especially a fish, moves through the water of a stream, and at the top here, you can see pictures of some of the streams where these different species are found. Um, they're leaving behind cells, you know, cells are sloughing off into the water. Uh, they're leaving behind fecal material. And if you filter the water that's in a stream, which is what you can see in these bottom photographs, um, if you have a little cup with a filter at the bottom of it, and you use a pump system to suck water through that filter, um, you're gonna be getting all different kinds of things stuck in that filter. You're gonna get sediments, you're gonna get that fecal material and the cells um, that fish and other animals are leaving in the water. And if you then take that filter into a lab and you extract all of the genetic material that you can from it, you can potentially get a lot of really great information about what species are present either in the stream exactly where you collected that sample or some ways upstream from where you collected the sample. And so what they're doing with these three fish is first of all, they're developing the lab techniques that are needed to identify those three species particularly. They're testing those lab techniques. And one of the things that they did to test is they actually put um, some of the focal species into this um, minnow trap. Uh, they put the minnow trap in a stream that didn't have any of those species um, present in it before. And then they collected water samples downstream of the minnow trap, and then they analyzed those samples to see whether um, the lab techniques that they had picked up um, the focal species that they were looking for. Um, they've done testing for two of the three different uh, techniques that they've developed. Um, the third one will be tested um, this year and probably running into next year. And once all of the testing is done, they will be able to collect a lot of different filtered water samples all around New Mexico. They're focusing on three different drainages, uh, the Mimbris, the Rio Grande, and the Rio Chama. And they'll get a really great snapshot of the distribution of these three focal species. Um, this is a lot more time efficient than some of the more traditional techniques for surveying for fish. Um, for example, in this bottom right-hand corner, um, you can see some of the team members electrofishing. Um, what that is, they're basically running a current through electrical current through the water. It temporarily stuns the fish and you can use a net and you can uh, take the fish out of the water and identify them and see what different types of species are present. Electrofishing is much more time intensive than basically taking a few minutes to collect a filtered sample. Um, so they can get a lot of great data in a short period of time and dealing with three species that our fisheries staff really need to, to know more about. Um, next project I wanna talk about deals with two different songbirds. Um, Again, this project, as you can see from the, the red dots on the map, um, involves surveys all around New Mexico. Um, these surveys focus on uh, mountain ranges in national forests that have ponderosa pine or mixed conifer forests. Um, and the, the two focal species for this three-year project are the, the graces uh, and the red-faced warblers. Um, and we were working with Envirological Services, which is a consulting firm in Albuquerque. So for these surveys, again, we got pictures of the habitats that these two birds use up at the top. Um, for this project, the researchers were doing point count surveys. And for those, what you do is you identify an area of interest on the map. And at regular intervals, you'll stop and you'll look and you'll listen very, very carefully for a specified amount of time. And you'll record all the birds that you either see or hear during that time period. And 
it's important to note that it, in a lot of cases, you're not actually going to see the birds. So you really have to have good ability to identify the calls of these species. And with that in mind, it's, it's better, especially for these species that they were surveying, to do the surveys during the breeding season when the birds are more likely to be calling. Um, once they had the, the point count data completed, they were able to get estimates of uh, both the density and the abundance or the, the numbers of individuals of these two different bird species um, across all six national forests that they surveyed. Um, they also recorded data on, I think, over 100 other bird species. So there's a lot of really good information that came out of this project. Uh, last research project I want to talk about deals with uh, terrestrial snails. Um, there are a lot of different species of snails found in, uh, especially in southwestern New Mexico, um, that have very small geographic areas where you can find them. Um, and really very little is known about a lot of them. So this is a really cool project that deals with uh, 12 different species of greatest conservation need. Um, and the contractor for this project is doing surveys in um, a lot of different mountain ranges all in southwestern New Mexico. So these are pictures of some of the mountain, mountainous areas where these surveys are being done. Um, some of the focal points where the researcher is going are these talus slopes with lots of loose rock, um, and especially the, the base of the slopes where you're more likely to, to have moisture. Um, the first thing that he, the contractor did, um, and he's coming in from, from Arizona, um, but the first thing that he did was to gather 900 um, different records of where these species have been found previously by other people. Um, and that, that data will be really helpful for me um, in forming Bison M, which again, I'll, I'll mention at the end of the, the presentation. Um, and it was also a really good starting point for him to figure out where he was gonna go in the field and, and focus his survey efforts. Um, he's basically just looking for these animals. He's turning over rocks. He's sifting through topsoil um, and plant litter um, thus far. And he's basically sort of in the middle of this project. Um, he's found about half of the species that he's looking for at 30 different sites in southwestern New Mexico. Um, he is identifying things that are potential threats to these species, and catastrophic wildfire is one of the things he's identified as a, a very likely threat in that part of the state. Um, and he'll be collecting more data um, through this year um, and possibly a little bit into next year. So I do want to talk a little bit about the, some of the wildlife education and rehabilitation projects that we funded. In this map, the, the pink uh, triangles uh, show some of the locations where the education projects that I want to talk about, where they've done work with students. And then the three maroon crosses show the three wildlife rehabilitation centers that I'm going to mention briefly. So the first of two education projects I want to talk about um, we've worked for four years uh, with River Source. And uh, River Source works with students primarily in northern New Mexico, at least for, for Sherwood Wildlife. They've been working with students in northern New Mexico. And they've been working to have mostly middle school and high school students have opportunities to get out in the field and collect field data. Um, and when they're in the field, they're focusing mostly on um, rivers and the riparian habitats right along the rivers. Uh, they're collecting data on water quality, um, and there's both chemical analyses that they do with the students, and then they also have students collect and identify um, the macroinvertebrates that you can find in the bottoms of the streams. Um, the sorts of species that are present in a stream can tell you a lot about the quality of the water in that stream. Um, 
using the Share with Wildlife Fund, since obviously our focus is on wildlife, they've also been increasing the data collection that students do with respect to any animals that they see while they're out in the field, um, any wildlife sign that they find, for example, these pictures of um, elk prints um, that they saw on one of their field trips. Um, and they've also been setting up uh, camera traps and having students look through the photos and see what animals are present in these riparian areas that they're, they're going to for their field trips. In um, 2020, because of COVID, uh, River Source also spent quite a bit of time developing some videos that anyone can view at any time um, that talk about the importance of riparian areas to wildlife and then ways that you can survey those areas and assess the, the quality of those. A uh, second education project I wanna talk about is with the Asombro Institute for Science Education. They're based down in Las Cruces. And they've been developing a bunch of both classroom and field-based activities for um, K through sixth grade students to, um, to be exposed to either in a classroom or um, at a long-term ecological research site that's located close to Las Cruces. Um, and the pictures show examples of some of the activities. So um, they have activities that focus on food webs and having students learn about how energy and matter flows through an ecosystem in New Mexico. Um, they have models. Um, in this case, this is a model showing um, how a researcher might go out and collect data on a songbird like a, a gray vireo. Um, and sort of simulating doing a, a point count like we talked about previously with the two different warbler species. Um, and then they also have for the field component um, of the activities that they're developing, they have students I, evaluate the quality of habitat for one species of greatest conservation need, the uh, black-tailed prairie dog. And then um, last but definitely not least, in the time I've been in the department, we've worked with three different wildlife rehabilitation centers. Uh, New Mexico Wildlife Center is based in Española. Wildlife Rescue Inc. of New Mexico is based in Albuquerque. And Desert Willow Wildlife Rehabilitation Center is based in Carlsbad. And all of these facilities have both rehabilitation work that they do, and they also have educational activities that they're involved in. And um, these are facilities where members of the public can bring uh, animals that they have found that are either sick or injured. Um, and facility staff will do all that they can to help heal and bring the animal back to health um, and to the point where it can be released back into the wild. Um, these facilities take in between 500 and 2000 animals every single year. Um, in addition to that rehabilitation work, they field hundreds of calls from members of the public related to wildlife in their neighborhoods, wildlife related concerns. Um, and they all have um, animals that for one reason or another were not able to be released back into the wild, but have become ambassadors um, and can be used for educational programs about New Mexico's wildlife and the importance of our wildlife um, and ways that we can all better live with the wildlife in our state. Um, just a very brief overview of the other part of my job, which is uh, helping to maintain the Biota Information System of New Mexico or BISONM. Um, as I mentioned before, BISONM is basically just an enormous database. Um, it has data on over 6,800 different species. Uh, if you go to the website and the URL is at the bottom right hand corner, um, you can get information on everything from species taxonomy, uh, their legal status, for example, if they're listed as threatened or endangered at the state or federal level. Um, you can learn about where they're found in New Mexico. Uh, you can learn about the habitat types that they need, what they like to eat. Um, there's all kinds of information you can get. 
Um, we also have uh, a list of references for each of the species and for the more recently added references, you can actually access the PDFs of the original reference. So if you need to know about a species in New Mexico, Bisonem is a great starting point. Uh, this is just a screenshot of one of the many species accounts you can look at there. Um, as a side note, the coyote is the, the species that I studied in, in grad school. Um, and so at the top, you have a, a summary of some of the information that you can get from the species account. And if you were on the website and you clicked on any of these blue bars, you'd get a lot more detail um, about, the, about this species, the coyote. Uh, this is the homepage for Bison M. If you um, were on the site and if you went to any of these drop down menus, you'd get to the key functionality of the website. Um, the main things you can do on Bison M are searches, and there's four different types. So you can go to the species search page if you want to look either for an individual species or Let's say you're interested in uh, birds that eat insects that are found in a particular habitat type. Um, you could do a search like that on Bison M. So it can be as, as complex or as simple as you want it to be. Um, for county reports, let's say you live in Santa Fe County the way I do. Um, you could get a list of species for Santa Fe County um, or for any other county in the state. Uh, the document search allows you to uh, look for any of the references that are associated, associated with species accounts in Bison M. Um, and the contract search allows you to search more specifically for uh, reports that have been submitted for Share With Wildlife projects that have been funded. Um, we don't have reports for every single project, but we've got them for a lot of them. Um, and I just, I want to end with just a few suggestions um, and, a, you know, a little bit of advice for anyone who's planning on going into a career in the natural resource area. Um, my first suggestion, which you, there's a good chance you've heard all of these things before, but my first suggestion is just to get as much hands-on experience as you can. If there's something that you're really interested in, um, Try to go out and, and do it, either through your school, through a summer job, through an internship, whatever opportunities you can find. Try to get out and do it and try it in the field, um, because realistically, you're not going to know what you really like until you try it. Um, if you have any interest at all in anything that has to do with technology and number crunching, um, hold on to those skills take classes that help you enhance them, do these things in your, your spare time. But if you know anything about and can learn things about programming, spatial data, analyzing data, and related skills, um, those are all becoming increasingly important in all aspects of natural resource management. Um, and having those skills will dramatically increase the diversity and the types of jobs that you'll be qualified to apply for. Um, and there's a lot of jobs now where you simply can't do them without having these skills. Um, you know, as you saw from some of the research projects I talked about, there's a lot of both quantitative and um, also even lab-based. So if you like lab work and want to do genetic stuff, genetics is another area that's incredibly valuable. Um, to have an interest in if you if you enjoy doing lab work. Um, next, I just would strongly suggest don't forget the basics. Um, every single employer who you might be interested in working with is going to want to know that you can communicate both um, orally and in writing. Um, you're going to have to talk to and write to all different kinds of people. Uh, both inside and outside your field. Uh, and the better you are at doing that, um, and the better you can express that both with your resume and in your interviews, uh, the better off you'll be in terms of being able to get a job. Um, and just behaving professionally and politely to people. Um, no matter what you do in natural resources, you're going to have to work with a lot of people either in the organization where you work 
or if you work for an agency, you're going to have to interact with lots of people in the public. And being able to do so calmly and politely is going to be very important. Um, and my last suggestion, find out what you love and find out how to incorporate that into what you do. Um, you may not be able to do it every day. You may not be able to have it be the focus of your job. Um, but find it and hold on to it. And I trust me, you, no matter what job you do, um, there will be days that will be hard. And if you have a passion and if you remember that and you remember why it was that you got into this field and why it was that you love getting up and going to your job, um, the better off you'll be on those days that are really hard um, and those days that sort of make you question <laughs> why, why you're doing what you're doing um, for your job. Um, this is my contact information. I am happy to answer questions either about what I do for the department um, or if there's just more broad questions about working in the natural resource arena, um, I'm always happy to, to talk to students about that. So thank you so much. All righty, thank you, Jenny. I uh, enjoyed your presentation very much. It was very informative, very educational. And I think that anybody that watches this presentation is gonna learn so much about the two programs that you do. and. Um, some of the stuff you were talking about, it was very interesting to me because I could think back on my college career, some of the classes I took, you know, we were working with a lot of non-game species, you know, either going out in our mammalogy class and setting out um, traps, trying to capture animals and learning that methodology. And also I was very fortunate to um, do a, an internship in Arizona my last semester of school and we worked specifically with uh, black footed ferrets, but we were also um, doing a survey of the prairie dog colony within the Aubrey Valley. But um, I just want to thank you for your time today. And with that, I hope you all enjoyed it and we'll see you at the, the next recording. So you all have a beautiful day. We'll talk at you later.